I think we all long to, long to be accepted. We all really want to belong. And for many of us, much of the time, we actually walk through life carrying a burden of trying to be accepted, of seeking to belong. It might be something we need to do, some standard we need to hit for us to feel like we're going to be accepted. Or perhaps it might be someone we need to be to belong that isn't quite who we actually are. Um, I'm a youth worker, so I work with teenagers. Uh, they've just been put through exam season. There is just so, such a burden, I'm sure many of us can remember, the burden, the stress, the anxiety, that comes with knowing that, that whether you're accepted into sixth form or into university that you want to go to, comes down to, to letters, or these days GCSE, I think it's numbers on a piece of paper. Are you in or are you out? Have you hit the mark? But it might not just be accepted into uh, sixth form of university. It might be whether you feel accepted by your parents, right? This thing can go deep. And it's not just teenagers. Uh, it carries on an adult life. I remember before I uh, started working here, I worked as an economist. And it, basically, when I showed up at work, it became really clear pretty quickly that to be in was to be good, to be smart. It doesn't matter whether you, you could be nice, you could be hardworking, you could be fun to chat to. If you weren't smart and you weren't good, no one was really that bothered, right? And so I remember I'd done my first piece of written work, like it was a 500-word article or something, and I, I, I gave it to my boss to edit. And like my heart was, I could, see, I could see him, he worked across me, I could see him typing away on the screen, thinking, oh, no, I hope it's not going to be too long until he gets it back to me. And then it came back to me, and it's track changes in Word. Every single sentence was gone. Like, so 500-word piece, there is not a single sentence I had written that he had left alone, right? In other words, not a single sentence was up to scratch in the eyes of my boss, right? And you just think, oh my goodness. Am I up to this? Am I going to make it here? Or perhaps it's just the much more subtle sense that you're never quite the person you need to be to fit in, to belong, to really be accepted. You just need to be that bit funnier or cooler or, or actually you can't, sometimes you can't even put your finger on what it is. You just know that it's not quite you. And so there's that sense that like you're always trying or there's always that, that mask on it. And if it slips and people realise that you're, you're, you are who you really are, well, you're going to be out. What if it didn't have to be like that? What if it didn't have to be like that? What if, what if there was a relationship that you could build your life on where you knew that you were accepted? What if we could be part of a community where we deeply, truly, permanently belonged? Well, as we open up Acts 15 together this morning, that is what God wants to say to us. That is what God has to give us. He wants to say to each one of us that with him it is different. That because of Jesus, we can be accepted by him. And because of Jesus, we can be truly belong in his people, his community, his church. And it all starts with this. We're saved by grace. That's the foundation, that's the bottom line. We're saved by grace. So in the previous couple of uh, chapters, Acts 13 and 14, we've been following Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey uh, around the cities of the ancient Near East, um, sharing the good news about Jesus. And as they've gone, they've been sharing the good news with two different types of people. We see them go to the synagogues and speak to the Jews, but then also turn to the non-Jews, the Gentiles. And wonderfully, because, because God is with them by his Spirit, both Jews and non-Jews have believed. Gentiles have turned and put their faith in the Lord Jesus. But now, those non-Jews are being told that that's not enough. That to be saved, there's something else they need to do beyond trusting in Jesus. Look with me at Acts 15, verse 1. Page 1110. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers... 
Unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. It's not enough, they said, to believe in Jesus, to trust in him. Unless you're circumcised, you cannot be saved. And not just that, verse 5 Look down, some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. It's not enough, they're saying, to believe in Jesus, to trust in him. You need to be circumcised, you need to keep the law of Moses. In other words, to be saved, you need to be a Jew. They're saying to the non-Jews, great, it's wonderful news that you've trusted in Jesus. Now, let's finish the job, you need to become Jews. Then you'll be in, then you'll be accepted, then you'll belong, then God can accept you. And we, in 21st century London, think that sounds utterly crazy, right? Well, why on earth would it be the case that you'd need to become a Jew to be saved? But what I want us to see is that if, it is gonna, if God's people were going to have to do anything other than trust in Jesus to be saved, it would be this. Because these marks, circumcision, observance of the, of the, of the law of Moses... These aren't things that human beings have made up. These are God-given marks of being members of God's people, of being saved, of being acceptable to God. For, for over a thousand years before the life of Jesus, this was, God, was the God-given mark of belonging, to be circumcised and to obey the law of Moses. That was what made you in. So if it's going to be anything that God's people need to do beyond trusting in Jesus, it would be this. So do we need to be circumcised? Do we need to observe the law of Moses? Do the Gentiles need to become Jews to be saved? Listen to what Peter says, verse 11. No, <laughs> no. Because we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. Everyone, anyone, is saved through the grace of of Jesus Christ, nothing else. Saved by grace. And I don't know, when, when you um, saw the title, The First Church Council, written on the front of your booklet, if you're anything like me, the word church council summons up pictures of, 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 of men with beards making decisions a long time ago um, and kind of deciding what we need to do. I want us to see that isn't what is happening here. No, they are reflecting on what God has revealed to be true, to be his will and his purpose. Because if you look at what Peter says, Peter doesn't say, guys, you know, I was, I was pretty tight with Jesus, and I've thought about it a lot, and here's what I reckon, here's what I think. We don't, we don't need to ask these guys to be circumcised. They can be saved. No, look at, look at verse um, 7. Peter says, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles should hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. God did not discriminate. God, God did it, God did it, God did it. Peter's just saying, look, all I can do is report to you what God has already done. Saved these guys by faith in Jesus alone, by his grace alone. And then James says, yeah, and it's not just what God has done, that's what God always said he was going to do. That, that's what he's, he's quoting Amos to show. He, he, as, he, as Amos says, the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name. So the Gentiles who bear my name, that's the non-Jews who are saved, who are in, who are accepted, who bear the name of God as Gentiles. The Gentiles who bear my name, who are saved without becoming Jews. And it's, um, James is saying that as Amos prophesied he was speaking of the acceptance of being saved by grace, through the grace of Jesus. So it's God who has promised this reality, it's God who has revealed this truth, and so it is God who declares to us today through his words that everyone who trusts in Jesus is saved through his grace. We don't need to add anything to that. We are saved solely through what Jesus has done, not through anything we do. Just through what Jesus has done, not through anything that we do. And that's because the grace of Jesus is an undeserved gift. 
The grace of Jesus is the gift of being forgiven. The gift of being accepted. The gift of being loved by God. All through the gift of a new life in Christ by the power of his spirit. It's all gift all the way down. Think about it like this. Um, imagine you were putting together your CV. I've been working here a long time. It's a long time since I've had to put together a CV. I'm not sure how in touch I feel right. But so normally you're thinking about trying to get your, your strengths down, your achievements, so that people kind of see the best of you. But imagine that, that this time your CV hasn't just got the best, it's also got the worst. So you've listed all your strengths, fair enough, but you've also listed in brutal honesty all your weaknesses. Okay, stop for a second and just think, imagine, imagine okay, so you've got some strength section and then you've got a weakness section on your CV. What are you really bad at? What do, you, what, do you, what, what, do you, what do you really struggle with? Okay, and as well as listing your successes, your achievements, you've listed all your failures in all of their gory detail. You've spelt them out, no holds barred, okay? And now imagine that this isn't really a work CV, but actually it's, it's not just your professional life, it's your personal life. That in black and white on this piece of paper... Are your greatest moments, the things you've done wonderfully, the moments you've excelled yourself, and your darkest secrets. The things you're most ashamed of. Imagine that written down in black and white are the thoughts that you've had that you would never, ever share with another human being. So if you've got the piece of paper in mind, okay, now imagine giving that to another human, to someone else. Maybe to a boss. Maybe to a friend. To anyone you love. Anyone you care about. It's horrendous, isn't it? Would, 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 they, would they ever be able to see you in the same way again? Would you ever be accepted? Would you ever be loved? You don't want to do that, right? You don't you know God's got it. You know God's got that. He, he knows everything. He doesn't know just the worst of your past. He knows the worst of your future. He's got it all. He knows it all. And here's the grace of Jesus. Jesus comes to us. And he scrumples it up. And he sticks it in the bin. I've dealt with it on the cross. It's all gone. It's done. He looks at us and says, I I forgive you. I I know it all. I forgive you. I accept you. I see you and I love you. You're with me now. And so we don't stand before God on our own. We don't stand before God holding our CV in the hope that it hits the mark. We stand before God in Christ. Christ. And so the love that the Father has for the Son and the Son has for the Father, that's ours, that unbreakable, from eternity, for eternity love, is now ours. We are utterly secure, infinitely loved, completely accepted. That's what it means to be saved by grace. And so when we start thinking that there's something we need to do to be saved. That's like getting the TV out of the bin, unfurling it and starting to touch it up. And say, actually, I've had quite a good week this week, so I reckon I'll stick down on this TV that I prayed every day. Or, or sometimes we get the TV out of the bin and we think, oh, oh, I, oh that's on there now. That, oh. It's done with. Jesus, done with it. We don't need to go again. It's in the bin. But we're so quick, aren't we, to, to want to, to touch it up, to, to, to work it again. We, mentally, those moments where we, we check our spiritual CV, we think, oh, I've done well this week, I'm, I'm on it, I'm on it, I'm on it. Or we, or, we, or we panic because we're not on it. Scrumped it up, put it in the bin. Jesus done, dealt with it on the cross. <laughs> we're in him. We're saved by grace. Because being, believing in Jesus isn't 
a line in your CV. It's not something to add there. Believing Jesus is leaving your CV in the bin and standing in him and saying, yeah, I'm with you. We're saved by grace. We're saved by grace and we're saved into a community of grace. We're saved by grace into a community of grace. Now, we live in a profoundly individualistic culture. The individual is the unit of understanding and the unit of analysis. And so we think of being saved by grace and being part of a community of grace as two separate things, right? So I sort out my relationship with God, that's saved by grace. And then maybe there's something to do with other people in this church thing, right? Wrong. (laughs) To be saved by grace is to be saved into a community of grace. If we're accepted by God because of Jesus... We are accepted into God's people, the church, because of Jesus. If we're saved by God, through the grace of Jesus Christ, we truly and utterly belong in God's people as part of his church by the grace of Jesus. And so can I say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're sitting here this afternoon and you're trusting in Jesus, it doesn't matter who you are, It doesn't matter what you're like. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what state your life is in. You belong here. You truly, really, deeply belong. We might come from different backgrounds, different life experiences, different ethnicities, different ages. We are all fully accepted, full members of God's people, through the grace of Jesus, there's nothing more we need to do. And that, of course, is part of our vision, right? To be a united, together, diverse community. But the question is, what, you know, in, in the, you know, it's cheesy, what makes a vision a reality, right? Let's, be a little, like, what, let's put it in a sense. What, what's going to take it from something that we know in our heads that we're accepted by grace as part of God's people, what's going to make that a lived joy? Something that we get to enjoy together. I think Acts 15 is given by God to to help us to see that path to living as a community of grace. Um, But you're going to have to to give me a couple of minutes to explain because the Acts 15 context is very different to ours. So I'll explain what's going on in Acts 15. And then I promise in a couple of minutes I'll land it for us. So, so stick with me. Um, because what we've got in Acts 15, and in the early church more generally, is two main groups. You've got the Jews and the non-Jews, the Jews and the Gentiles. And we've seen already that both are saved by grace. Both are full members, fully accepted into the people of God through the grace of Jesus Christ. They don't need anything else. But the question remains, how are they going to live that out? What will it look like to form a single community of grace where Jews and Gentiles live together, embodying and displaying the boundary-smashing grace of Jesus Christ? And that is where the requirements made of the Gentile Christians come in. Okay? So um, they send this letter to the Gentiles, and I'm going to read, start reading again verse 28. This is what it says. Um, the letter says, verse 28... They write, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You're to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid such things. Now, there... If you stacked up all the books written on that, those two verses, it would be above my head. Like, this is, you know, people have spent hours and hours, years and years, decades and decades trying to work out how these four things fit together, where they come from, what they're doing. Um, and I just want to give you a sense of the big picture of what I think is going on here, which is that the Jerusalem Council, the, the apostles and elders, as they gather together, are trying to work out what do we need to require of the Gentile Christians? What sacrifices are we going to ask them to make so that they can be part of one community with Jewish Christians? What are they they going to need to change so that they can live side by side as brother and sister in one community with Jewish Christians? 
So they're being asked to sacrifice, the Gentile Christians. They're being asked to stop doing some things. But we need to not miss, the Jewish Christians are being asked to make sacrifices too. Because the, the, the subtext here is that the Jewish Christians are being asked to live alongside, to share meals with, to be brothers and sisters with Gentiles who don't follow the law, who aren't circumcised and who don't keep the Mosaic law. And for many Jews, that would have been unthinkable prior to the coming of Christ. So I promised you we'd come back to us. Here it is. What does that mean for us today? It means that as we grasp our acceptance in Christ, as we know that we are accepted by God through Christ, and crucially, as we recognize that every single person in the church is also fully accepted by God through Christ, we're going to stretch... We're going to sacrifice out of a desire to make sure that everyone experiences that acceptance as a reality. We want everyone not just to know in their heads that they belong here because of the grace of Jesus, but to experience in their heart, in the life of this community, what it means to fully belong because of nothing else than the grace and gift and new life of Jesus. So sometimes, um, that might look like stopping doing something. So uh, I'll give you an example, and I'm going to do a distanced one from another church. Someone told me that um, they were at a church, not this church, where um, they just noticed over time, well, kind of subconsciously, I guess, that lots of people, including pretty much all of the leaders, whether it was a small group, whether it was church, would basically all be in designer clothes all the time. Now, there is nothing inherently sinful about wearing designer clothes. And I, I'm actually pretty sure that it wasn't an intentional decision to try and create an in-group and an out-group, a cool group and a not-cool, whatever. But the effect was that over time, it came to feel like, unless you wore that stuff, you weren't really in. There was something else you needed to do beyond receiving the grace of Christ to truly belong. Now, I mention that because I don't think that's a danger here. I'm, yeah, I've not got any designer labels on, which is, I can safely assume that because I don't dress very well anyway. So, the question for us is this. As we grasp the acceptance of God in Christ, as we long for everyone to experience that acceptance, what is God prompting us to stop doing, to stop saying, Because deliberately or not, what it communicates is that there's something other than trusting in Jesus that you need to do to belong here, to be really accepted here. I'm going to keep thinking about that, and I guess I challenge each one of you to keep thinking about that too. So sometimes playing our part in a community of grace looks like stopping doing something. That's basically what the the Gentile Christians were asked to do. And sometimes it looks like starting doing something, especially what the Jewish Christians were asked to do. So let me give you an example. Uh, When this service finishes, will you instinctively, he says, knowing that this is what instinctively I do, look for your friends, look for the people you know it's going to be a nice conversation with and you're going to enjoy and maybe have a laugh? Well, as we know the acceptance of God in Christ, as we long for everyone in the church to experience that acceptance, won't that move us instead to go to the person we don't know who's sitting on their own? to make sure they experience what it is to be accepted by God in Christ? Or when you think about um, inviting people around for dinner or for a meal or, or a social time outside of church, do you instinctively, again, hand on my own heart, do you instinctively think, oh yeah, like who'd be, oh yeah, it'd be really nice to hang out with them. I've not seen them for that, would be great. Well, as we know the acceptance of God in Christ as we long for everybody in this church to experience that acceptance, wouldn't that prompt us to, yeah, spend time with people we love, organise to hang out with people we know, but equally to invite those we don't know, those who aren't like us, that they might know what it is to be truly accepted, to know they truly belong because of the work of Jesus. Those are the kind of small steps that over time 
by the grace of God, can shape us into a community of grace. A community where anyone who shows up here and accepting Christ or who comes to accept Christ and believe in him can experience full and complete acceptance and belonging as part of God's people. And let me just say that this kind of life together is not a nice to have, it's not an optional extra, it's essential. The Gentile Christians are given requirements. This stuff matters. It's a call on us. And as I've been reflecting on this week, I think it's one, one reason why it matters so much is this. I genuinely think it's pretty hard for anyone to believe that they are accepted and loved by God just because of Jesus if they've not experienced acceptance and love in God's church just because of Jesus. It's pretty hard for anyone to really truly believe that they've been accepted and loved by God through Jesus if they've not experienced that acceptance and love in the life of God's people, the church. I know that for me that was huge for me to put those, place, those, those, those things in place, to really see how my life was built on the grace of God, was, was for me to experience that people welcomed me and loved me, even though I was a bit of an idiot and a bit of a mess. It's crucial. It's crucial, it's essential, and we can't do it. In our own strength, we cannot build a community of grace. The, the, the clue's in the name, a community of grace. It's a It's a gift. A community like that isn't something we can build in human strength. It's something, it's a gift that we receive as we open ourselves up to the work of the Holy Spirit. Verse 28, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. It is the work of the Spirit to guide the church, to bind the church together, to form the church into a community of grace. And so we will not become a united and diverse community or a community of grace by trying to be a united and diverse community, by just gritting our teeth and giving everything we've got. We'll become a community of grace by worshipping Jesus together. By lifting our eyes to the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and experiencing the grace that we have in Jesus. And asking for his spirit to be at work, to help us, to shape us, to form us. That's how we become a community of grace. Now, before I close, I want to put all that into the the big picture of of the book of Acts and of what it means to be together on mission. I think there's a couple of things um, for us to see here. The first is that a community of grace is essential for God's mission. The community of grace is essential for God's mission. So so we've been called and empowered by the Holy Spirit, Acts 1 verse 8, to be witnesses to the ends of the earth, to witness with our words to the good news of Jesus, to speak of his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, to proclaim that Christ is Lord, that in him forgiveness and acceptance and salvation are found. And those are crucial tasks, and we need to proclaim that good news to a world, to a city, to our friends, to all who desperately need to hear it. But it seems to me that one of the few ways we can make that message believable, plausible, compelling, is by being a community of grace. That that it is as people who don't know Jesus are confronted with a community that only makes sense because this is true. A community characterised by undeserved love and undeserved grace that crosses all social boundaries. A community where people accept one another, not on the basis of a nice face or, or how, we put our, you know, how we kind of put our face on and, uh, and pretend we're all okay, but who accept each other in their sin, in their flaws, in their brokenness. A community where the acceptance that is visible shows up the world's counterfeit that says, oh, we are are so accepting, we're so tolerant, we love all different kinds of identities, we accept everybody, as long as you're not actually really that broken or messed up or struggling. That says, that displays that true acceptance, true belonging 
It's possible only through the grace of Jesus. So a community of grace is essential for God's mission. And finally, a community of grace is actually the goal of God's mission. Jesus did not come to save individual people as individuals. He died and rose again to save for himself a people. A church, a community. And so when Christ returns to bring in the new creation, it won't ultimately really be just me and God and that's what it's about. No, it will be God's people from every tribe and tongue and nation gathered together around the throne in the presence of God. And so one of the great joys of being saved by grace is that we can, as we trust in Christ, as we look to the power of the Spirit, we taste heaven now to the extent that we become a community of grace. Let me pray that for us now. Oh, Father, we are lost in wonder at the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he came leaving the glory of heaven and humbling himself to become one of us, humbling himself even to death, to death on a cross, that we might receive forgiveness and acceptance and love and a new life as we share in his resurrection. Please, Father, open us up to the work of your spirit that as we grasp the grace of Christ, that we are saved by grace alone, we will be filled by a longing to be a community where that grace is lived out, where that acceptance and that belonging is real for all who trust in you. Amen.